if you look at our galaxy alone, our galaxy has arguably a hundred billion stars. A hundred billion stars. Now, that's a lot of lot of stars. Just in our little teeny weeny little galaxy called the Milky Way. Now, again, this is where science comes to the rescue. Twenty years ago, scientists would have told you that planets are not a prerequisite in the universe. That we are a very unique little specimen, our little planet, and our solar system. In our little galaxy called the Milky Way, we have arguably 100 billion stars. If that could change tomorrow by one little fluke discovery. Now suddenly, just a couple of years ago, they discovered that if for every star, there's most likely a brown dwarf, which is just a, a much older star that is not so bright, and we can't really see them. Here is um, a pretty obvious point that you can see. We have a very, very brightly lit um, object here, as well as the companion that I've always said that was with it. And we also have the sun going down. So there's our sun going down. This is Nibiru sun and companion, whichever it is, brand dwarf, who knows. Planet X, whatever you want to call it. That's the bugger in the shot there. Now, this has been really hard to get this footage yet again, so um, I'm hanging on to this one, because it's very hard to get it, unless you do it at exactly the right time. Alright guys, thanks for watching. By the way, this is pointing west, not east. There are many predictions for December 21, 2012. This is one more, and a regrettable one at that, because it predicts a day of fear and doom for the unprepared. For the prepared, it will weigh upon their souls, but not upon their resolve. Therefore, the first rule of predictions must be, always be mindful of them, but never live in expectation of them. Rather, view the world as it is, and trust in your own powers of observation and judgment. And know this, the greatest truths are 
by necessity, simple. When they do appear, they touch us with a new sense of clarity and direction. Wait and observe patiently. In time, they will appear. But also know this. If they are not what you expect to see, you will not recognize them. In July of 2008, the circle makers pointed us at 2012. They gave us a formation which shows the orbital relationships of the planets in our solar system in December of that year. At that time, the Mayan calendar ends and something momentous has been foretold to occur. This now brings us full circle back to a point made earlier in the program. That if the predictions contained within the Avebury 2008 formation come to pass, that we'll be seeing what appears to be two suns in the sky. The first part of the formation was reported on the 15th of July 2008. Note that the major planets in our systems are perfectly aligned to the date of December 21, 2012. Therefore, the first part of this formation serves as a date stamp for the purpose of this prediction. The when, if you will. The what is revealed in the second part of the formation. Reported on the 22nd of July 2008, the second part of the formation tells us that we will see what appears to be two suns in the sky, and that after that, our planet will be hammered by brutally catastrophic solar storms. Also consider this, though both parts of this formation appear days apart, they nonetheless overlay each other with absolute surgical precision. And together, both parts reveal a crop circle formation that is nearly the size of four soccer fields. Now that's big. So if the crop circle makers needed to create a formation this large, then we have to ask the question, how bad could it be for us? That being to start over, beginning with a simple spot, as it's called, a single point of truth. Find the spot, and the dots will always connect. I first began by reviewing my group's creative analysis, and excluded the comparative analysis that always seemed to cause us so much trouble. Doing that, I quickly found my spot. A Canadian engineer by the name of Richard St. Laurent had identified the legend in late 2009. A legend explains the pictorial language of the map. It gives us a sense of how to interpret what we're looking at in combination with other elements of the map. In terms of the complete formation, the star map legend Richard found was off to the side, as most legends are and it appeared with the second part of the formation, first reported on July 22, 2008. And in late 2009, Richard had identified the legend as this small elliptical glyph. At that point, what I and my Avebury 2008 analysis group had been incapable of achieving in the previous 18 months, now came all together for me in less than 18 hours. And the dots connected Perfectly. Okay, friends, we're going to take a look at this shot that came from, I think it's uh, Costa Rica, in the mountains here. We're going to zoom in on this. All right. I believe I can see it with this camera. I don't know. Anyway, right here is the object we're talking about. This is the sun. This is the mountain range here. Oh, you're not going to see the mountain range. Okay. Let me see if I can back out. Anyway, this is the object right here. And let me back off. This is the mountain range, okay, where they were looking west. All right, and there's a cloud formation. We'll zoom back in. And right here is our object, okay? That right there, my friends, is the blue planet, okay? And following it is the red planet. This is the one that is actual footage, okay? This is no joke. Object of interest. 
which we have now designated as the Blue Kachina from Hopi Prophecy. The Blue Kachina Prophecy is in two parts. First part is the blue kachina, which is the harbinger object, and then following after that is the red kachina, and that's the one that brings all of the misery. The green arrow pointing down in the middle is pointing at our object of interest, and the one pointing up at the bottom is at a known reflection we call yogi. Now, watch as they are closing. What we see is that our object of interest, the blue kachina, does not move like a reflection. Next up is a persistence study and here you can see that the object is moving down to the horizon very nicely as it always does. But focus on the last frame in this sequence and you can see while all the other reflections are gone, our object remains. In the inset, what you see is a screen capture that I took from my Starry Night program. I want to call your attention to the line at the bottom of that insert, which is the horizon. And that is parallel with the horizon at Turrialba. However, the green line moving vertically is the ecliptic. And when you are trying to determine the exact location of this object, you have to use the ecliptic and not the horizon. So let's fire it up and see what that movement looks like. As you can see, the ecliptic is a moving target. It's constantly going back and forth. You know, it kind of reminds me of a windshield wiper. Now, keeping in mind how the ecliptic moves through the sky from the viewpoint of the Vulcan feed at Turrialba, let's take a look at 2012 and then 2013 to see how our object, which I call Blue Bonnet, tracks with the ecliptic. I think you'll find it interesting. We first find Blue Bonnet in May 16th, 2012. Moves south and then turns right around and starts heading north again. And it's quite an interesting track. Our first image is of the 6th of January of this year and as you can see, Blue Bonnet is just moving south all the time. Now to make it interesting, let's combine 2012 and 2013 to see what we get. Here we have our 2012 plot and let's add 2013 to it and what you see is in 2013 Blue Bonnet is moving away from behind the sun. However, when you flip the two years around, what you get is something that looks like this figure eight pattern. But what you have to remember again is this object is orbiting another object which in turn is orbiting our sun. And what we also see is it is moving out from behind the sun as well. Now to help put that kind of a corkscrew pattern in mind, here's a tremendous video graphic from a YouTuber I think really puts it in context. <laughs> 